Home is a place where one lives, was brought up, and has a feeling of belonging and comfort. In this film, Spid looks at local listed buildings, and for the first time, at a non-listed one, and their communities. We started our journey at the modernist building of Kensal House. We then moved on to the brutalist architecture of Trillic Tower. Going south, we encountered the contemporary Lancaster West, the site of the Grenfell Tower fire. We ended at the Georgian Crescent of Stanley Gardens. As we met with the residents of these buildings, we learnt their stories and the wider community of North Kensington. Community is a, a group of people that, that, that live in the same place that actually look out for one another. It's a little bit um, more um, intense than being just neighbours. It's about where you share each other's joys and you also share each other's pain and you support one another through those issues that life can bring. North Kensington is a place of many faiths. Um, there's certainly there's a very large Islamic community here. Also there's a lot of Irish, a lot of Portuguese and um, we all pretty much get on together. It was lovely to move here, um, and there's, there's, there's some lovely people here. It's a very unique place, um, Kensal House. It's, um, everybody seems to get on and have a respect for one another's beliefs and their values. The problem is with the repairs, it's a very old building. They need to do, Kenston and Chelsea really, is, is, is throw a heap of money at this place because it's a grade two listed building. My opinion of social housing in the whole country needs a massive, great building programme of social housing. In, in 1980, the right to buy came in. The word banded about is gentrification. And it's the whole thing about people who live in social housing that we're the underclass. You know, it's not about bashing the rich, but it's about that it's not a crime to live in social housing, and it's not even a crime to be poor. I think it's a wonderful privilege to be able to live in something, you know, something as lovely as these buildings. And I think the uh, most important thing is, though, that you, you must accept the responsibility for them, I think, and realise that they've been here a good long time and they were put here by people who knew what they were doing, wonderful architects and landscape gardeners. I think it was Thomas no, Allen who, who built the, these houses. So with the piece of land, they planned the whole of the Ladbroke estate with 16 of these garden squares. And every one of them has got a, a, a big percentage of social housing. Everybody uses the garden. We have a party, a garden party annually. We have a Guy Fawkes party. And so everybody joins in that. Instead of the garden square being um, in the middle of the road, as it is so much in, London, in many of the London squares, you've got to come out of the house through the front door and cross the road, all these gardens, um, the houses give directly into, into the gardens and therefore it, it, does, it creates a community. And particularly in our garden because we haven't got any private gardens before the shared bit. So, you know, you've got to think of it as a whole. Yeah.
I guess when you, you called me up to talk to me about this project, I just wanted to let you know that, or I, the reason I wanted to do it was so that I could share that there is a really strong community feeling in Trellick and that that has added to my, just my experience of living in a community that um, acknowledges you and looks after you, looks out for you. And, you know, I'm a 44 year old girl and I, I don't have my own family. And I, you know, it's to be included by others. It, it's a, it means a lot. You know, I've been happy here. You know, this is a microcosm for how I think, you know, society could be. Laughter. I have to say, some days I'm up in my flat and the door's wide open and I hear the laughter down here. And I just think that's a good space when people are that chill that you hear laughter, group laughter. Yeah, and that brings me down. That's my favourite sound here. It's, it's a gift for me to be in there. I'm so lucky. I love modern architecture. And that is... That is a jewel there, that building. And uh, yeah, I love living in it, yeah. In West London, this is the last wall in West yeah, London. This is the last. They have to beat this is the last. last. You know, this is here since this is here since like '87 when we painted. I'd like it to be remembered as the place where you could come and paint some good art. Yeah. That's what I would like to remember it. But you know what? The powers that be, you know, the forces that exist right about now in London in particular, it's inevitability. This gives, this gives culture. Yeah. You know, this will, imagine this being gone. Yeah. Nothing here. Yeah. So, nothing so, here. So, so, so also what what really upsets me is then. Where do young kids who want to explore in the world of graffiti art, where do they go? Where do they go? For the value of five or six flats, maybe, you know, we're losing a community space that has a value uh, for infinity while it exists. And that's the whole community of the use of that space, mainly the children's play area, which they need. Your child should be out of the house twice a day in a place like this, making friends, social engagement, learning how to live in love with your neighbour. And that's what that space is about. Uh, it's teamwork, it's whether, you, you know, you, loyalties, you live and learn, you make friends, you fall out, you're friends again. You, without places like that, how do you get that extra kind of social education? And that's what... I've pretty much lived here for all my life. Depending on what area you are from, you know, it does have an effect, you know, whether, you know, you're poor or poorer than someone, or not necessarily rich, but better off. Yeah, there's definitely a sense of like community and you know friendship and stick it together. It's a horrific thing that's happened with the tower. About the listing, uh, these things happen. I mean, the space is not really famous. Maybe famous in the sense of carnival, good Labour Grove. But if you think about where Latimer Latimer is, it's in between Shepherd's Bush, which is well known because of Westfield and um, Labour Grove, where um, where carnival happens. So. It's not shocking to me to find out like no one really knows about this place. The fact that pe now people know about this place because of the fire. Um, yeah, what can I say? I mean, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing? It's a bad thing about the fire, but now that people know about this place, I don't think it's really going to make a difference in any sense. To be honest, it's only when the Grenfell Tower fire, that when that happened, that made me realise the the difference between the poor and the rich in this era. Not to say that the rich or the middle class didn't care about the poor. Everybody came down on the day and obviously helped out and tried to support the community. And none of this stuff would happen or none of this neglection would happen in a richer building. I'm grateful for whatever we, we get, obviously. I mean, compared to what's lost, I don't feel like, you know, you can't replace it. People in this area, they don't look at each other from the point of view of religion or background. Um, and I think this is partly thanks to the TMO, the original TMO, because it encouraged people to go to these meetings and have the social events together. So we got to know each other and we treated each other as a fellow 
citizen, a, a neighbor, a friend. Even if we didn't know each other, we would say hello in the street because we met uh, at a conference or a meeting. The TMO is the management organization. It was formed uh, to manage the stock of the council in 1996. But then there was uh, a time where the members of the TMO were asked to vote for the TMO to get extra powers, and that would make it into an arm's length management organization, which stands for ALMO. So when the organization adopted the ALMO powers, had the power to make decisions as without having to ask residents to participate. Uh, I think the most that they were expected to do was to consult them, and most of the time, not before they made the decisions, but afterwards. And in some occasions, no consultation at all. After the fire, there has been a lot of um, mess. At first, everybody seemed to be together. There was a togetherness. Everybody was so amazed. People who um, were claiming to be representing other groups of people were not really representing them or they were not representing their good interests. I am very disappointed with the public meetings. Nobody has ever been able to listen to the people in the panel at any meeting and nobody has ever been able to ask any questions. We have to wait until things um, sort themselves out because nobody is taking the responsibility to, to correct uh, what has gone wrong. Through exploring North Kensington and hearing the varied life experience of its residents, we have discovered a community that continues to look after and celebrate its diversity, especially when it's most needed. Everybody just needs to learn how to stick together because you never know what's around the corner, to be honest. Do you know what I mean? It could be, you know, a disaster happened to, uh, um, it could be a disaster happening to someone that's rich, you know, in a rich house. And then there could be a poor family opening the doors to them. You know, these things, these things happen. I feel like we need to first learn to be human first than anything. And, you know, being human is, you know, is helping each other. I've written quite a few pieces on the Grenfell fire and this piece I wrote was after a Channel 4 documentary when some people from a village in Cornwall, just random, got together, they clubbed together and they took the children from Grenfell and gave them a week's holiday by the sea. And I found this very moving. And there was a young Islamic girl speaking about her mother and it, it brought me to tears. So I penned this piece and it's called Aisha and the Sea. Aisha and the Sea. O oh sea, you are so powerful, I am so small. Waves rush past me like the fleeing, gently receding pulling sand over my toes, embedding me once more into this earth. Innocent, unpolluted air filling, cleansing my lungs from the dark soot of pain that clings to my soul like limpets upon rock. For fleeting seconds, I forget that beacon of despair. It is washed from my mind, feeling one with nature, the sea, staring towards the horizon reclaiming, restoring my hopes and my dreams. Nightmares briefly extinguished by this planet's womb-like amniotic waters. Everything's so perfect here. Mother smiling with her eyes that sparkle again, twinkling like the sun's glistening rays in the surf. I am a child again, no longer old before my time. Oh sea, you are so beautiful, I am so small. Thank you.